Any questions from the floor? Yes, uh, start here. Uh, so I'm Oscar Clark. I'm uh, working on various things, uh, Pi Mobile, social games platform, as well as my own things. Uh, I've been involved in uh, online games for a very long time, uh, running game services with BT, 3 Mobile, and uh, more recently PlayStation Home. Uh, I think it's really interesting talking about brands and games. That the problem I've had every single time I've tried to introduce these kind of services is getting uh, advertising guys, ad media agencies to understand the model first. Mm. But their objection seems to come from how do you get the reach and how do you get a repeatability so they can make the experience work more than once. Okay. Is that something that we think we'll ever solve? Graf, do you want to? It's very early days, and the problem is, <clears throat> and there's a lot of problems, right? I think that the, the way the current industry works with media agencies and creative agencies and so on is not really, doesn't really work in, 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 in games. Uh, <clears throat> I think also the the games industry, specifically the social and, and, and online games industry, is still very young. Uh, I think everybody is still learning and testing. The, um, the problem is there's no clear pricing model, for example. Like, obviously, if you go in print and TV, there's clear pricing, there's GRP and uh, other ways. Uh, but it's not really there yet. <coughs> so I think I, I, I know that a lot of. 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not really true. I think that. Oh, it is. I, mean, I have been trying to do this. Yeah, yeah, but it's only relatively yeah. recently that you had really companies, first of all, that were open to work with brands uh, at the studio level, not just at, a, at, a, at a, the C level. Sure. Uh, we actually had game developers that actually understood brands as well. Um, <laughs> there's exceptions, right? Yeah. Okay. And then also where you had actually had games that actually had a reach where it really made it sense to. to, to, to uh, take a risk and making that uh, only good. But I think it's, it's happening. I think it's happening more and more. I think the uh, EA, for example, just for the Sim Social uh, game in the last six months already had four really big global campaigns. Uh, it's increasing, it's growing, it's getting more and more important. The budgets are getting bigger, the campaigns are getting deeper and more clever. But I think there's still a long way to go. I don't think there's a fucking like clear answer, like this is how it's going to get solved. I mean, I think if you're talking to brand people and they're comparing it against television, okay, then, you know, they're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so it seems to me, as always in marketing, it's horses for courses and you have to say, what are the complementarities? And, and so this is more about engagement, probably with less reach. And one just has to say, that's what it is. Now let's use it for what it's good at. Uh, would be, would be uh, my reaction. Other questions? There were several people here. Hi, I'm uh, Arjan Groen. I'm an executive MBA student here at uh, LBS. Uh, in the examples that, that Jardin and, and Ref showed us, we saw big brands entering the market that already have an audience and have a reach. Um, how does that work? Does, does it work for small brands or new brands? And if it does, how, how is it different? Jardin, do you want to comment on that? Um, <coughs> yes, it's a good question. Um, I actually. Uh, um, well, brands are brands, so I think if you're a small brand or uh, even a big brand that's old school and it's not very cool, <clears throat> then I think that uh, games can, can really give a big boost to a brand, so it's easier to do something exciting for, uh, I don't know who, than uh, say Coca-Cola. I think the one example I can use, which is actually very old school from the days of the PlayStation 2, was it, and GT, was with Subaru in the US. Subaru wasn't present in the US at all, they had one dealership. But if you remember GT, it was GT2 or 3 maybe, it had a lot of Subaru cars, they were very, very cool. And GT obviously was very successful, I don't know how many copies they sold in the US. Two or three million at that time or something. Yeah. <coughs> but what had happened is the result of that was that uh, Subaru in the US, kind of their sales increased by 10,000% because there was nothing to compete with. And all these kids were playing the game and then went to, to dig up Subaru and now it's a big brand, or at least bigger than it was uh, in the US. And I think when something like that works, you know, if you've got a new, a new, a new startup, uh, then you know you don't have any customers, you don't have any brand, you probably don't have any money, and and therefore, in order to build brand awareness and so on, you you quite often you're looking for buzz and various indirect things. And so, if if you can create a game which becomes a story, in its own right, then then you're starting to get sort of more of a reach. Uh, I'm not a games guy myself, so. I can't give you four examples, but sort of in principle, that's what I'd look for, would be something which was um, actually sufficiently interesting that it got media coverage, uh, which, which therefore sort of leveraged the direct playing. Well, the, uh, the, the, the real issue, and it was mentioned in the, in the talk, is uh, 
you know, reach versus engagement. Mm -hmm. In-game advertising, you can get very cool with it. You can have the, you know, uh, an ad appear that's aimed at your demographic as you round a corner in, in, in a uh, military sim, like, like uh, Call of Duty or Battlefield. But you're going to hit the same people 50 times. And so for traditional marketers who are talking about reach, they want big reach. They don't want 2% reach 50 times. They want 50% reach two mm -hmm. times. So, but as people learn more, you know, Four years ago, very few political candidates even knew what Twitter was. Mm -hmm. Now, even the beginning candidate has a Twitter, you know, tag, and so I think that it will slot in um, where it's appropriate in advertising campaigns because people that work for the brands in packaged goods marketing or cars or services will have grown up with it, and the people that work for the ad agencies will have grown up with it. So, you know, Twitter only took four years to go from nowhere to, like, everything. And I think that this phenomenon of gamification or games and brands or brands and games will get more sophisticated, <coughs> more uh, scientific, and more creative very fast. Uh, yes, there. And then, there. and then I will come over here in a minute. Okay, yes. Hi, gentlemen. I'm Kasha. I'm a master's in management student here at LBS and I'm a gamer. And I wanted to ask a question about uh, the tension between the new paradigm of having a lot of choice and user-generated content, and then at the same time trying to introduce a brand and then manage its image within an online social environment. Um, okay, um, one of the problems with user-generated content is that the users generate content. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, um, the first thing that they will attempt to do, given any, any opportunity, is to create an image of a penis. <laughs> and um, I'm just is this male yeah. users mostly or not? Um, they're, the, they're the early adopters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, so um, you've got a game and you can go into the game and you can buy McDonald's cups. What the people do, they buy 50 McDonald's cups, arrange them on the floor. What kind of shape? Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> um, I was speaking to uh, people who were, um, they, they developed an MMO and it was uh, for a, it was a church MMO. It was it was called um, Ship of Fools, and they were they kind of kind of cool guys. Even though well, sorry, I say even though they're Christians because I'm an atheist, so I can look like even. Um, but but they, they were kind of cool guys, and they developed this game, and it was basically a, an online church. And and I, I and I said, Have you got much user generated content? I said, No, no. People generally go in there and t you know talk and stuff. Um, they've got a few animations. I said, Have you had any problems with the users? And I said, Oh yeah, yeah. First thing. We got a praying um, animation. Oh, right, yeah. So, of course, you've got one person there standing like that, <laughs> and another person down there too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always noshing. <laughs> so, you get these problems. If you let the users create content, they will subvert your problem. Now, you might not care, because at least there, there might be a, there might be a, pro a protest against McDonald's, you know, 100 meat in every, 100 cows in every burger. Ooh, that doesn't sound great. Um, but it, it might be some kind of protest. But on the other hand, people hear about it. And on the no publicity is bad publicity, you know, and all publicity is good publicity, then mm. well, yeah, they hear about these things. Mm. So, so long as you're prepared for it, then you can do it. Mm. Likewise, if you um, one of the problems with games and brands is it's OK if the brands match the game. So you're playing a football game. If you go to a football stadium and there's all these advertising hoardings around there, well, if you go into a game and there's no advertising hoardings, you might notice it, or you might notice that they're all made up because um, they, they didn't talk to the right people. And you don't think it's so. You actually want <coughs> real adverts there, but you don't want to be playing in a fantasy game and you slice somebody's head off and then whoopee and then oh wow, I can go and buy a coke. <laughs> that, that's kind of take the edge off what I was hoping for. Nevertheless, you will complain about that, and everyone will have heard of Coke. Mm. Coke may have done that in order that people will complain, and now we all know about Coke or Mars bars or whatever else you've put in there. So, so long as you know what the effects are going to be, you can work off that. But if you just go in thinking that I can put any product in any game and the people will love it, they won't. They won't even love it when you can buy things that make context in the game. If I can buy for real money a bigger sword, that makes me feel foolish for having used the smaller sword. 
when I could have paid real money, but I resent buying a real a bigger sword for him because I already bought the game. Why do I have to pay more money for a bigger sword? So you've got to you've got to know your audience. So that means understanding the players. That's what game designers are very good at. Um, but game designers are no good at marketing. Marketers know a lot about selling things, but not a lot about game design. They know about playing games because nowadays they're all hip and trendy and they grew up playing games. But they don't know about designing games. It, it, the, the way to think of it is not games, books. If you're reading a book and um, Romeo's about to kiss Julie, uh, turn the page and Julia whips out her iPhone and says, just a moment, I've got an iPhone 4. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, put it away, Julia. You want, you want to see the, you know, so just think of it as books, that's a pretty good analogy. If it's going to work in a book, it might work in a game. If it doesn't work in a book, then you know it's not going to work and, if, and your meta method might be the one that does work. I mean, I think the thing about sort of quotes inappropriate UGC actually comes back to your question about startups. That something which frankly would be inappropriate for Coke if it went viral might be very good for a little brand which just mm. wants anything which goes viral. So yeah. that's yeah, another sort of. I'm not sure if it's just a problem with, with games, right? I mean, social media brands lose control anyway these days. So it's not a specific game related problem, I think. Any brand in the world is getting confronted with an audience of people who are very vocal and can be very vocal and can do pretty much whatever they feel like. So I'm not too sure if it's a specific game related issue. That's, or that's or true. Because the internet. What's the consumer in charge? You had a question? Hi, uh, my name is Alexander Pay, work for a mobile agency in the West End. Kind of dual prong question. Zynga, Farmville brought the isometric template to the masses. What's, what's going to be the next design evolution of that? I mean, brands who are, who are looking into this space right now, they see social gaming as an isometric template <laughs> that you, you play around with. What are we going to see kind of as the next big evolution in that? And secondly, and more in your direction. What's the missing link in taking social games onto mobiles? I mean, we, we haven't seen any huge successes in that. Zynga have, have made, I believe they made Farmville. <laughs> yeah. They've made Farmville available on that. Now, screen size, real estate, etc., gameplay, completely different to, to a big screen to a small one. What's the missing link there? So what square is a social game on phones? Yeah. There are other plenty. Yeah, I've, I've applied my body as a social games platform that's been incredibly successful delivering social games on mobile. But it's a very different mode of use. Yeah. So there are specific design changes you need to implement. Uh, and we've got games that are generating you know, $10 a month ARPUs, having a conversion rate for, uh, it's all freemium based games. And we're seeing something like 15% of players on certain games that are very well designed delivering you know, revenues at that kind of level. So they do exist. <laughs> Can we just come back to your first question, uh, Richard, uh, briefly, the, the next thing? Yeah, the, the next thing, uh, the thing about social games is that they're not really games and they're not really social. They're particularly not social. Um, they're played on social networks, that's why they're called social games, but they're not really social. You're not really playing a lot with other people. You're playing and you've got these little strands, you're not really interacting with them. Um, and they're, they're not all really alike games because they're mainly extrinsic rewards rather than intrinsic rewards. So you give, you're, you're told how great you are, but you never really feel you've done anything to... You know. If people play those games a lot, they'll gain some concepts of what games are. They'll come to a greater understanding of what it is to play a game. At the moment, we're ba we've basically got uh, like 100 million naive gamers. They don't really know what they're doing. But as they start to play, they will wise up they'll find some things more interesting and some things not. We saw this in the casual game market, where people would play very simple games and then they found their niche. And a game like the old Where's Wally, you know, there's a, there's a screen and somewhere on there's Wally and there he, Nowadays, if you go and play the Find the Hidden Object games, they're hardcore, really hard. I mean, you wouldn't be able to play the hardest ones unless you like, got your magnifying glass out of the pixels. They are really hardcore but they're still casual games. Mm -hmm. What we'll see is people who, are more, who become more interested in particular niches. So we won't have 100 million paying um, Farmville, but those 100 million people will be playing games. Um, the platform, Facebook or, or whatever, some of the games will be on there. 
moving to mobile phones, I, what I can see is people using playing again one game across multiple mm. platforms. So I'll play it on the mm. on the big screen when I get home. When I get uh, on the train, I might do some trading, which is uh, all the little handsets good for. But if I want to buy and sell things, then it's sort of subservient. We've been looking at this for a long time with MMOs. Um, it's not really come off yet because people didn't have the, um, the, the, the mobile phone book, in it, basically. But now we probably could. But what I see is an education in games. But I don't think that, uh, that the 100 million people who are playing Cityville, they certainly won't be playing Cityville in five years' time. But they will be playing something, and it will be more sophisticated but in multiple dimensions. Well, I think it already happened if you look at the current and the latest, EV, like the latest single games even. There, all of those games, I don't know, I'm not going to go too specific, but Empire and Alice, for example, is a much better game as actual real game mechanics. Yeah. Proper people from proper, who made proper games before yeah, work on those games. I think it's already happening that you move away from the initial click fests and the very, very basic things to already something which is not really full-blown rich I'm an immersive game, but it's still, it's already a lot better, I think, than, than early days. Yeah, then you'll take coming. Uh, yes, I actually want to uh, go back to the question of the future of social games. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, what they said. So, I'll just copy and paste that. But I just want to <laughs> add that uh, I think there's actually a lot of space. Uh, we mentioned briefly in game advertising, which has been going on for about 10 years, and um, correctly from wrong. Hasn't really quite taken off like people expected it. I think uh, Ralph mentioned only 10% of Zynga's revenues are from brands. I think there's a lot of potential in that. I think uh, you know everybody's excited about the free-to-play model, but we forget that you know only 5% or something similar actually do pay. If we can monetize the other 95%, perhaps with brands or you know other other revenues. Uh, that could really uh, push the industry even further. The problem I think with in-game advertising is that fundamentally most of the games that have in-game advertising, uh, it's an afterthought. First they build a proper game and then they stuck some banners on top of it, which, you know, players are smarter than that, brands are smarter than that. <coughs> I think we'll see a generation of games that are designed for brands or for in-game advertising from the ground up. Uh, maybe they won't be very wide, maybe they'll be focusing on specific niches or industries, I don't know, a game for cars or a game for I don't know, music or whatever, but I think uh, we'll see those things uh, emerging very quickly, I hope. Thank you. Now we have two questions over there, and I'm going to need, a sort of, and another one here, I'm going to need sort of some guidance from you. We're actually, we, we're getting towards half past eight, but you seem to be a very attentive audience, so I'm happy to continue this. We've got a question there, and then a question there, and then a question there. Yeah, hi, uh, Kunal from the MBA program. Um, I had a question about the how you measure the impact of this on sort of bottom line. Or, I'm sure a lot of the skeptics uh, in in various businesses ask, you know, okay, well, how do I how do I how do I know whether this is working or not, or not even uh, conceptually, but how do I change? Right. Do you want the, so can you, well, what do you mean with this? Uh, with social gaming, per se. So, like American Express wants to actually use social gaming now. In so, how, how did Amex know it was getting a return on investment? Is, and is and also, how does it know if it needs to make changes or how do you measure? Okay. Uh, the <laughs> Again, it's still very early days. There's no, not a lot of, there's not a lot of, sort of like clear guidelines that this is how it works. I think <clears throat> if brands want to go down that direction, they know that there's a lot of upside because if you're talking to a huge audience and there's still a lot of creative freedom to do those kind of things. Um, but I think it's a very good question. I think a lot of companies are struggling with that. Also to, it, it's, it's related to finding the right pricing model. Because how do you price that? Right? Do you basically price on a per contact basis? Do you price on a per engagement basis? Like how many minutes have people spent uh, engaging with my with, with my brand? I think it is a very good question. I don't have the answer. No? Everybody's still struggling with it. You can do you can do surveys, you can use Nielsen and, and other companies but it's still, it's one of the key areas. I think Yarden basically has a couple of interesting ideas around how to measure uh, ROI for these like branded game experience. But I think at this moment, it's one of the reasons I think why probably it's not bigger than it is. Okay. Okay, so uh, because Ralph kind of <laughs> for this, I have to, we, I have some ideas on which we disagree, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of so I think for the type of uh, kind of brand games we're looking at, which are really, I think, uh, fairly similar to television advertising. I mean, we see that as sort of a next generation, in terms, especially in terms of emotional engagement. 
I think a good measure, or is starting to measure that, is actually measuring dwell time. So I would argue that maybe one minute of gameplay is the equivalent of a person watching two 30 second TV spots. Of course, assuming that each person has actually, each one of those spots was actually seen by a focused and conscious person, which of course we know in games, we can't necessarily know in television. So you could argue that actually the same ROI on television and games would probably be higher in games. Uh, you could also argue that people that play games, maybe, especially on mobile platforms, you know, uh, when there are ad breaks, they actually sit there with the iPad or the phone and talk on Facebook, <coughs> so that reaches a unique audience. But um, obviously, this is, you know, uh, many people have different opinions on this question. And, and by the way, this is not unique to you know games in marketing. You know, we have we have large areas of the rest of marketing, sponsorship and PR and so on, in which you you can make. You know, database, evidence-based judgments, but they are judgments. They're not. They're not kind of sure. yeah, uh, something that I, I just want to. This is just a, a point, so you know about social games. Mm. They are. You go into a social games complete. The walls are full of screens. Each screen is showing who's playing, who's paying, what games. They do extensive A/B testing. They'll increase the size of the button on the screen from 13% to 17%. Half the users get it, half don't. Within 30 seconds, they know whether that's increased the income or not. If it's not, off it goes. If it's in, everybody gets it. That's what it, it's highly incremental, very metrics based. Um, so it's not, there's, there's no guesswork in, in terms of how much money these things are making. All the data's there, but what we need is the analytics to, con to convert that into. Well, they sold that, and, and but are they going to go out and buy the product yeah, next day? And that's the that's thing. The missing thing is all of the data available, yeah. which yeah. is a good starting. But you still need someone to see. Like it's one thing to know that 32 million people got the Farmville mm. uh, Centurion stage, a statue in, in their farm, and that they did it for two weeks and so on. But it still doesn't measure how people no. feel towards the brand before and after. Okay. So you still need software. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Question here. Hi, Tiago from the Masses Management Program, and. Um, I want to go back to the user-generated content question. I'm a player for almost seven years of a specific mod. Oh, and Yeah, <laughs> Akea. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh, wow. From Iron Realms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing that actually makes me go back there is the possibilities of creation and, well, it's just right, reading or actually writing a book. You can actually influence the world that you're in. How far do you think is the actual graphical gaming industry from that sense of having the possibility to really directly influence the world you're in? Um, okay, this is a general game, but I suppose this is for me. Um, <laughs> well, the, the trouble is that 90% um, of everything that's created is utter rubbish. It's nonsense. If you let other people in it, you will, um, you will find that um, for it to be meaningful, you've got to be a reward. So if, if you're creating something that somebody else is going to play, then there's got to be some reason to go there. So people will go to your content in order to get something. So there are two, and it's binary. There are only two ways we ever see. One thing is, as soon as you walk through the door, there it is. Here, come through the door, you can have it. We want lots of people to visit our areas because we're giving away what you want for free. That's one, the Monty Hall thing, you know, the of the century. You just go through and you're just giving it. And the other one is a death trap. You walk in and everything is there to kill you. And you're not going to get it. And if you do get it, you spent so long trying to get it that the designers just laughing, counting at how many times you died. And there's nothing in between. We never, so user-generated content um, for general other users to use is either going to be um, vacuous or a death trap. <coughs> If user-generated content for your content for your friends is another matter, because for your friends it might be that, that what you created is rubbish, um, but to your friends it's not rubbish because relative to them it's actually pretty good. Um, in absolute terms, it's rubbish, but you don't care because it's still much better than your friends could could do. And so, if you can keep the, the area small, then user-generated content's pretty good. Um, th th I mean, everybody knows that 10% of every of something, you know, it's um, Sturgeon's law, 10% is good and the rest is rubbish, but the trouble is that everybody thinks that what they've created is in the 10%, mm. not in the 90% and most of it is. Mm. So you can get 
um, user-generated content which <coughs> is good and meaningful, the, the trick is to constrain it so it's only within the, like, the Dunbar numbers mm. of the, the player's um, social circle. If it extends beyond there, that's because somebody has done an editing job and, and, and has seen which games are being, or which content's being used a lot, taking a look and, and decided whether that's something worth elevating to a greater area. That's, that's how, it's, how it's done. I, I'm delighted you mentioned Dunbar's number, which is sort of 150 to 200, and that's the number above which beer is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, question. question here. Yeah. Uh, my name's Ari, I'm from the Masters in Action program as well. Mm. Uh, my question was, we've uh, talked a lot about uh, how there is a new market of social gaming online and how, that's, how that differs from console gaming, which is more traditional. And I, was worried, I was wondering whether there were ways in which that experience could be replicated and transferable to the console gaming. So we saw that uh, in terms of content delivery and revenue models, uh, social games will be give you free access and then charge you for specific games or levels or missions, etc. And uh, I was wondering whether you thought there was a potential for exploring that experience on a console. So beyond just downloadable content, maybe offer free access and then charge incrementally for you know each level or uh, each each extra stage that people think players want to play. So that will customize their experience and also allow that casual experience to be explored on console game. Well, there are variations on that theme with PlayStation Network. Mm -hmm. um, the the yeah, the consoles are all connected, the phones are all connected, everything's always connected, so it, it becomes a variable that you can test, and the, the smart people are testing them, and, you know, also, I, I, I know a fellow that's doing, I think, crossword puzzles, or a fellow in Romania, and his currency are called pearls, and so you, you bet these pearls, and then you get points if you get the crossword puzzle, and, you know, it's a fairly straightforward game design, but, uh, you can buy 10 pearls, 100 pearls, or 1,000 pearls. There are about 100 per, uh, per P. And there's one 20 pound purchase option for a million pearls. And it's like 10% of the purchases. Because even though the people will never use a million pearls, if they, they play the game 24 7 for the next five years, they, they can get a million pearls for 20 quid. So they buy the pearls. <laughs> So, I mean, there, there are all kinds of permutations and um, things that are not necessarily uh, intuitive, but uh, can th 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 that free play or free trial is going way beyond just phones and, and PCs and into the consoles as well because well, of... Uh, premium also exists in PlayStation yeah. Home. Yeah, it, it's remarkably successful even though it doesn't look like it. Okay. I think uh, I know of one uh, first party publisher is actually working on the first free to play console title. But obviously, the, the problem is <coughs> that there's a lot of parties involved that need to be paid. Right? I mean, there's a, mm -hmm. what are you going to do with retail if you're going to give away games for free? I mean, there's a lot of issues. That's also why I think at this moment it's only first party publishers because they own at least a big chunk <laughs> of, <coughs> of um, how the world works. I think. Well, I think free-to-play is going to be the dominant business model in, in, in the games industry. So do, do you believe there's a sustainable path that, for example, having a Call of Duty game, which instead of paying £40 for it once, you can get a free access to and then have to pay for you know, individual packages or level? Just totally. To yeah. I, think, I think they're probably less than two years away. <coughs> Check out uh, World of Tanks. It does just that, it's free to play immediately. Mm -hmm. It's very cool actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would caution that the long term future um, isn't so rosy because one of the things that people learn when they play games a lot is a concept of fairness. Mm -hmm. And if you're playing a game and somebody else is buying a, a cooler looking tank but it's functionally equivalent, mm -hmm. you don't worry. If they're buying a tank which can, uh, has got a 5% extra kick to it, then they do worry because that means in order to compete they have to pay. They don't want to have to pay because they signed up to play a free game. Um, as, a, as an example, if free to play was so great then you could, if you were a country, um, pay a million pounds to give your marathon runner a five metre start. <laughs> now, five metres in a marathon, nothing. Would we let the people do that? No way! Because it's got to be fair, the mouth has got to be fair. And, and the dimension that we're checking is um, physical fitness. You're, um, basically, how much of a freak of nature are you? 
that's the fair, so within that, it's fair to be a freak of nature. But um, outside of that, you know, I'm um, somebody who's, you know, I'm a busy person, I can't afford to do all the training, I don't see why I should um, have to um, run, run 100 metres and train for that, why can't I just buy the 100 metres record off, mm -hmm. off the record holder? Mm -hmm. so it's got to have some, it's got some meaning to it, but and that's a fair decision. It's true, but I think... I know the town will people, people in game studios and game creators are getting better. And I think by introducing, for example, multiple currencies, a certain <coughs> currency you can actually you can actually only get by playing the game and by getting better in the game. There's things like that's also why the whole game economy comes into play. And it's totally true if you would just make everything the one with most money wins, then it's not exactly a fun experience for no one actually. So that's also no, why I, I think well sorry. I, I'm, I'm not going to draw it to an end because we've right. we've got a twenty to nine. I'm happy to say I think uh, Raf you can stay as well because there are drinks because <laughs> <laughs> I know several there are some more questions to come uh, so you've been a very very engaged audience so I just on your behalf uh, warmly like to thank our panel because they really have been absolutely true